ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the organizing committee to invite me for this talk during uh, our department congress. And I'll start my talk. I will talk about uh, traumatic tracheobronchial injury. I am Muhammad Tahan, a professor of cardiothoracic anesthesia and surgical intensive care in Mansoura University, and currently working as associate professor at Imam, Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University in Saudi Arabia. And I'm standing as a board of director and education chair for the European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology, EACTA. First, I declare I received the free airway device samples from AMBO and AirTrack in 2014 and 2015 for use in two studies. I have no direct or other interest in AMBO or AirTrack in the context of this lecture and other studies. First, um, we'll start to talk about traumatic uh, tracheobronchial injury. It might be rare. It can occur up to 0.5 to 2.8 percent of cases, but you have to put in your mind if it happened, it can be life threatening because most of them are associated with other significant injuries or other significant comorbidities. And it is estimated that 30% to 80% of patients, unfortunately, die after experiencing tracheobronchial injury before presenting to emergency department. And even if they survive, the very operative outcome is less favorable in 50% of cases. Tracheobronchial injury has different reasons. One of them, it could be iatrogenic tracheobronchial injury. It might happen during the thoracic surgery. Here a case report recently published in uh, last August about uh, iatrogenic bronchial injury during thoracoscopic surgery, which require repair. You can see here is the cut section for this illustration of the trachea. And uh, I'll show you with a pointer here. This is the transection. You can see here the injuries here. This is the carina. Here is the left upper loop. And you can see here with the encountered tear in the posterior bronchial human on the right side. Uh, post intubation tracheal rupture is well known as well. Uh, secondary to aggressive intubation maneuver, particularly in the cases of airway difficulty. And you can see here, here is a bronchoscopic view. There is a tear, longitudinal tear, secondary to encroaching of the endotracheal tube and injuring of the wall of the trachea. Also, you can see in uh, iatrogenic injury for tracheobronchial tree could have in secondary to endotracheal intubation, foreign body inhalation, in tracheostomized patient, and with endobronchial intubation, like this case with using of W tube or clockers. Here with using of W tube, and there's encountered bronchial rupture because if you are going to inflate the bronchial cuff of the W tube or bronchial cuff of the blocker, too much inflation leading to ischemia and rupture of the submucosal blood supply and leading to increase the pressure with rupture of the bronchus. So be careful in this. Uh, more worse if you have iatrogenic tracheoarterial fistula, like tracheoanemonate fistula, which is a real but life threatening condition and very challenging indeed for you as anesthetist. This is usually, we are usually can see this so with a patient with prolonged tracheostomy, but interestingly, in this case report, you can see uh, this is uh, obvious here in a patient with prolonged intubation, young boy. 16 uh, year old with tracheonominate fistula. You can see after trachea resection, you can see here is the cut section of the trachea, and you can see the fistula here is the connection between the innominate artery and the main trachea. 
which is a challenging indeed because these patients have a severe hemopsis. Another issue which has come to the surface during the last eight months and COVID patients, there are several observations of severe pneumomediastinum after trickle intubation and using high ventilation settings, particularly with using of high PEEP and, and different phenotypes. You can see here, this is a COVID-19 patient so with phenotype L, where you can see less infiltrations here and more aerated area. However, despite this, because this patient doesn't get benefit from using of high level of PEEP, they need larger tidal volume. You can see the patient suffering from severe pneumomediastinum. You can see here the air here is around the heart and the pericardium. Uh, the anesthetic consideration for tracheobronchial uh, uh, aspirated foreign body, uh, bronchoscopic extraction for inhaled foreign body, it would associated with several complications. You know, we must know them about uh, like severe laryngeal edema or bronchoconstriction, and sometimes require tracheostomy or tracheal intubation. However, also you, these patients might experience tracheal or bronchial laceration during extraction of the foreign body. Uh, there is other uh, core reasons here. Uh, what's about the incidence of um, the type of uh, ruptures? Transverse ruptures for iatrogenic injury occur in 70% of patients and usually in the upper and middle part of the trachea. Longitudinal ruptures occur in 18% and usually secondary to blow out. Again, it's the clause, the glottis leading to rupture, longitudinal tear and rupture of the tracheal wall, as you can see in the first case reported during thoracoscopy. Complex rupture, fortunately, it happened in only 8% of cases. You can see some sort like a compound fracture, uh, rupture like this one, which is challenging for securing the airway and the challenging for surgeon as well to repair it. Non-iatrogenic tracheobronchial tree injury. Here is the experience of five years from this study. They have a blunt trauma in 64% of cases. In 22% in, uh, the penetrating injury are the reasons. Gunshot only in 4% of cases. Interestingly, the the location of penetrating injury usually in upper and middle trachea and mainly in upper part and occurring in 75 to 80 percent of penetrating injury and then 80 percent of plant trauma occurring in the middle trachea and is about 2.5 centimeter proximal to the carina and mostly secondary to shearing stress damage and fixed point, uh, which is a cricoid and the trachea is fixed between the cricoid and carina. So any plant movement leading to tearing of the trachea. 43% of plant injuries occur in two centimeters distal to the carina, usually on the right side and also to the same issue and breast injury causing extensive anteroposterior chest wall compression and forcing lungs laterally apart laterally with creating a negative intrapleural pressure that causing a laceration and traction on carina with a vulsion of bronchi. What are the symptoms presenting for these victims? For cervical tracheal injury, usually there are subcutaneous emphysema in the neck. If there is a penetrating injury, you can find air bubbles coming, uh, escaping from the one neck and uh, stridor, cyanosis, progressive dyspnea, respiratory distress, or dysphagia if it is a chronic injury. And for thoracic tracheal injury, you can find the extensive subcutaneous emphysema may be extending up to groin and the massive ill leak if you insert a chest tube for pneumothoraxes, you found 
continuous leak coming from chest tubes, persistent lock collapse after insertion of seracostomy tubes, chest tubes. You still found the lung is collapsed in X-ray. That's meaning is indicating that you might have a thoracic tracheal injury, tracheobronchial injury. Bishop might also experience hemopsis, cyanosis, progressive dyspnea, or respiratory distress. There are non-operative and operative management for these patients. Non-operative management, which is a conservative treatment, it could be considered if you had uncomplicated effective ventilation. There is no issue regarding ventilation. And there are short tears localized, which are superficial or sufficiently covered by tissues. There is a moderate a non-progressive emphysema. If you have extensive and the progressive emphysema, this is indication to go for surgery or intervention, pulmonary, interventional pulmonology, like inserting of stent. No esophageal, no associated esophageal injuries, no signs of sepsis, no evidence of major complications with the mediastinal space or impending mediastinitis. This is our the indications for non-operative management. For operative management, the indication if the patient requires mechanical ventilation that cannot deliver to bust lacerations, there are continuous LE, there is inadequate and ineffective ventilation. It is a very important for you as anesthetist because you are going to tailor your anesthetic plan accordingly to know the operative access, the incision of the surgeon. If you have a uh, surgery on the thoracic and uh, cervical part of the trachea, it should be through a cooler cervical incision. For the middle part of the trachea, middle third of the trachea, usually through sternotomy or clamshell incision. For carinal injury, or also for a surgery on carina and surgery on right mean bronchus, usually right sarcotomy is preserved, otherwise it will be a nightmare for surgeon. For distal uh, left mean bronchus injury or lower bronchi, left lower bronchi injury or surgery, you, uh, the surgeon can access through left sarcotomy. The preoperative assessment for patients with tracheobronchial injury should be emphasized on the presence of life threatening hypoxemia to plan and to secure the airway and to manage this hypoxemia, as I'll show you later. You have to check the patency of upper and lower airway and you have to roll out the presence of penetrating injury because if you have penetrating injury, you have to close the penetrating wound. Uh, the extent of injury should be defined particularly as the extent of new mediastinum and emphysema. If you have a massive emphysema and massive uh, and, uh, neck and you need to secure the airways, this is challenging because you found the same emphysema inside the soft tissue of the pharynx. If you have a severe neumium with the astenum, it might compress the bronchi. It is not common, but it might happen. Associated major injuries, secondary to trauma, like a traumatic patients for non iatrogenic tracheobronchial injury, you might have a tracheobronchial injury major uh, traumatic brain injury, sorry, and uh, abdominal or vascular injury. Associated comorbidities for the patients should be identified. And accordingly, you have to estimate the risk for these patients. There are different scores for these patients. The simplest you can consider uh, any surgical scores like BPOCM or others. For investigations, as anesthetist, you should exert vigilance to review the chest X-ray and the CT scanning for to know the extent of injury and design your plan for securing and isolating lung. 
three-dimensional trigger reconstruction are very helpful indeed to know the exact location of injury and its extent and help you to plan further. Flexible bronchoscopy, it is usually needed to locate the extent and exact location of injury. However, fibro optic bronchoscopy, it should be reserved to operative room. Once you get the patient to proceed with surgery, after securing airway, you have to consider using a fiber optic. Perioperative monitoring for patients undergoing surgery for repair of tracheobronchial injury should include in his standard monitoring. And of course, arterial line to monitoring direct arterial pressure and the plus gasometry. However, when you have to insert your arterial line, if you are using radials or ulnars, right or left, there are two opposing opinions. Any one of them could be used. If you are inserting in the right radial artery, it gives you early warning if the surgeon is going to compress the innominate artery with lossing of arterial traces. However, in this time, you are losing the reading for prop pressure, which is a hell. So the other option to put the pulse oximetry on the right side and insert the arterial line in left radial or ulnar artery. So you have uninterrupted direct measurement for prop pressure. And at the same time, if the surgeon is compressing the illuminate artery, you lose the trace of pulse oximetry. Monitoring of depths of anesthesia with open airway is very important indeed because you, most of time we cannot administer volatile anesthetics. We are using total intravenous anesthetics, particularly during the pandemic, which is announced by the WHO in March 2020. We have taken precautions with working with patients with tracheobronchial injury because you are dealing with patients with open airway. In such case, you have to limit the number of staff inside the room. You have to warn up the adequate level or high level of personal protective equipment. And if possible, you have to consider doing surgery in a negative pressure room. Preparations, the most important step to succeed in rescuing these patients to be prepared. Be prepared, otherwise it will be a failure. You should have two sources of oxygen, one from your, for uh, your anesthetic machine and one auxiliary oxygen source because sometimes you need to provide apneic oxygenation, you might need to provide high frequency ventilation and you should have a complete two sets of not only classic endotracheal tube, but also enforced endotracheal tube, as well as microlaryngeal tubes. So you have three sets, classic, reinforced, armored reinforced, and microlaryngeal endotracheal tubes. All of sets have a different sizes, starting from size four up to size eight. Different sizes of third generation of uh, laryngeal mask airway, like Supreme or other, and uh, sorry, like any intubating laryngeal mask, it could be helpful. Sometimes you need it. If you need to do scope, if you cannot secure the airway, probably if you want to introduce the scope and so on. Uh, using video scopes are essential in these patients um, to look where are you going to advance your tube until you bust the glottis. Flexible fibroscope is mandatory, is a reusable or disposable flexible bronchoscopes. A catheter mount with a double swivel elbow connector, like this one, as you can see here, this is connecting to the breathing circuit, here is connecting to the tube, and you can insert your fibroscope through the slot here, which is a swivel valve. It could be, it should be available. 
and you need two sets of for this one because you will start with this one and after securing the airway during surgery we have what's called cross-field ventilation i'll show it to you so you need the sterile one to be opened at the surgeon end to ventilate the bronchus directly i'll show you later on how to do this uh, two suction devices rescue drugs including all stations vasopressors infusions installed on infusion pump and titrated it should be ready high frequency jet ventilation which is a manual one or any device if available it could be very helpful in some patients like severe coronal injury uh, you should have a facility to have extracorporeal life uh, supporting uh, oxygenation like ECMO or Novalang. And this is the different sizes of plates, different sizes and different shapes of endotracheal tubes, the classic uh, armored reinforced long microlaryngeal tube are essential as I told you. Anesthetic management including geyser general anesthesia with or without neuromuscular blocking agents, according to the surgeon, sometimes surgeons need to monitor the function of recurrent laryngeal nerve, regardless of the surgical approach. If it's cervical, cooler incision, or during sarcotomies to monitor the function of recurrent laryngeal nerve, so in this case, you cannot use a neuromuscular blocking drugs. Usually, we are considering using of total intravenous anesthesia, TIVA, because volatile anesthetics, it will be lost through the open airway to the atmosphere, and you cannot ensure adequate depth of anesthesia for your patient. Okay, how to secure the airway for a patient with traumatic bronchial injury? If you have a proximal injury in the trachea, in the upper part of the trachea, you need to intubate the patient and pass the laceration side or injury side. However, you should be wise enough. You shouldn't be a crazy. Who's the crazy? The crazy one who was driving the car while closing his or her eyes. So you cannot insert the tube blindly. This is obsolete indeed. Instead, you have to use a fiber optic bronchoscope. Once you bust the glottis, stop with the tube, insert your fiber optic, and advance us to beyond the laceration or injury in the trachea under direct vision with the fibroscope. For the distal trachea injury like this one, you have to bust the injury also with a tracheostomy, could be inserted through the wand if you have a penetrating wand directly. This is one solution. If you don't have a penetrating wand or a small penetrating wand, using a long a micro laryngoscopy uh, uh, tube, it could be inserted, as you can see here, and you can intubate selectively the left main bronchus or right main bronchus and ventilate one lung. Or, and they should be checked with a fibroscope. I talked to you about the cross-field ventilation. After exposure of the trachea, either through cervical approach or thoracic approaches, you, the surgeon need to repair the posterior wall of the trachea. I will start to repair the, and the, your tube is inside the field. So you have to throw your tube up and surgeon insert a sterile tube. This is why you have a two, three sets or uh, one set from each type of the tubes. You give the surgeon sterile tube, which is inserted sterilely directly into the open airway, either the trachea or bronchus. And with a mount catheter, you can ventilate the patient. So you can directly through the field a tube, usually armored reinforced tube, is inserted by surgeon and connected by the mount catheter to your ventilator. Sometimes, this is here as a reference for this, sometimes you, if you have incomplete tear, you might use a W in tube, uh, like as you can see here, a left side W in tube can bypass the tear in this case of a distal tracheal injury. What's about if you have a right bronchial tear? You have a tear here and the near or already advanced 
right bronchus, right mean bronchus and lung. So you need to ventilate the other lung. You need to ventilate the left lung. In this case, you have to use a left side double human tube to ventilate the left lung. Okay. Is an example here of one of our cases. We had a lady which is 44 years old, which is a victim of road traffic accident, referred to our hostel with bilateral pneumothoraces and extensive surgical emphysema. Her baseline saturation was 94 on non rebreather mask on 100% auction. And you can see here the cuts for CT. You can see here the left meme bronchus. Here is the right meme bronchus is disrupted, as large as you can see. And you can see it is irregular, there is no a well contoured. As you can see here. This patient has a right mean stem bronchus injury disrupted of right mean bronchus and she had initially a rigid bronchoscopy in the operating room with 6.5 was done in conjunction with high frequency post pressure ventilation and under glycoscopic guidance uh, left side a 35 french w tube was placed beyond the glottis and to not be crazy and not to drive blindly with the tube, the double human tube is not advanced blindly, but it's advanced over the fibroscopic guidance to the left main bronchus to isolate the lung. Here is using of glidescope to advance the tube. Also, similarly, there are a possibility in such cases to use high frequency ventilation as described in this child with traumatic bronchial rupture and a two-year-old boy and uh, was uh, run over by a car and was admitted after uh, and the developed cardiac arrest was in 20 minutes and badly damaged soft tissue and the uh, right deltoid muscle flap uh, is uh, used after experiencing of emphysema, tachypnea and cyanosis. Okay, I talked to you, I know you might uh, not have uh, high frequency gene ventilation at end at your center. Instead, you can consider using high frequency post pressure ventilation. You have at your hand your anesthesia machine, anesthesia ventilator. So you need to adjust settings to pediatric settings and administer tidal volume of just two to three milliliter per kilogram of predicted body weight. And you can consider frequency 40 to 60 with IA ratio not less than 0.3. That's not correct one, should be one to three, one to four. And you can see the curve here. This is the high frequency boosted pressure ventilation. Okay, what we do if you have a left bronchial injury? You can see the injury here in the left bronchus. In this case, we are not going to ventilate the left lung anyway. We are going to ventilate the right lung with inserting of a right side W in tube and ventilate the right lung. Okay, what's about a composite? and the carinal injury was marked worsely injured the carina like this one. What you have to do, what you're saying? You need in this case to ventilate each lung individually as one option. So in this case, you need to use what's called double single human tube technique with inserting two small microlaryngeal tubes, just four or size four or size five micro laryngeal tubes under fiber optic guidance, one on the left side and one on the right side to ventilate each lung individually. You insert one small, both of them through glottis, one adjusted by fiber optic to ventilate the right lung and one to ventilate the left lung. Otherwise, you can use two fully caster, but it is challenging to insert them. It could be directed by surgeon to ventilate 
as a right lung and the left lung and right lung by two catheters. And in this case, you cannot use a conventional ventilation. You are having to use this one. This one is called ManuJet. It is a manual high frequency jet ventilation. It is counting on your pressing on the pistol. And you have a pressure here. We have a driving pressure to adjust the pressure 5 to 20 BSI. Okay, if a patient has a worsening hypoxemia and lacerated carina or disrupted carina or composite injury of the carina like this one, the solution in this case, it should be using of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation with ECMO as been described in different cases. This is the ECMO machine. And if you are going to use ECMO, you can consider, I know surgeons are worried about using of ECMO for thoracic surgery, they are worried about, they are concerned about bleeding. In this case, you have to consider using a low dose of heparin or no heparin at all to maintain ACT between 160 to 200 or 250. ACT is activated clotting time. A steepwise increase in ECMO output starting from 2 to 4.3. If you are using ECMO, most of time you need just venovenous ECMO, BV ECMO, rather than arteriovenous ECMO. Arteriovenous ECMO could be considered if the patient associated as a associated myocardial injury or heart trauma with severe hemodynamic compromise. Here is uh, an example of uh, successful use of ECMO for surgical reconstruction and uh, with a transected meme bronchi um, novel as described before, and this could be used. And here is the auction source, here is the patient groin, and here is the femoral catheter, and here is the flu probe. Here is the arterial line. So you are getting blood from venous to the oxygenator. And here is the oxygen source for the oxygenator and returning back to the patient. A treatment of tracheobronchial injury, it could not be only operatively, but it could be by surgery, I mean, but in interventional pathology play a major role nowadays. They can insert the stents everywhere, even in limited, non transected tears in a patient who is otherwise uh, a little bit maintained oxygenation. So, there is an example of tears here in the uh, left, um, uh, right main bronchus. You can see the tear here and this treated by stent. There are different types of stents, as you can see, different shapes, even a bifurcated stent for the carinal injury, all of them can be used. Here an example of stents, if there is injury in the upper part of upper third of the trachea, a stent can be placed. If there is injury for the carinal part, a Y-shaped stent, could be used and hence it would save you from uh, using of ECMO or Novolang. For uh, bronchial stent can be used for a uh, right mean stem bronchus or one of intermediate uh, bronchial injury. Stent can be used for the main left main bronchus injury. Also stent can be used. This is an example of the stent placed inside the patient. It is usually challenging in the future if this patient needs thoracic surgery and lung isolation. So you have to be very careful when you are going to place a blocker rather than a WM tube in a previously stented patient. What about the anesthetic management? Uh, local anesthesia and intravenous sedation, it is usually considered for interventional stent placement, general anesthesia with total intravenous anesthesia and less commonly with volatile anesthetics as I told you with or without neuromuscular blocking agents is considered. Airway and rigid bronchoscopy usually is required before securing the airway. 
you can consider using a laryngeal mask airway to do diagnostic flexible bronchoscopic examination before securing the airway and operating room and endotracheal tube tracheostomy as showed before. Spontaneous respiration which is one of the options preferred by some um, uh, practitioners. Controlled ventilation or high frequency ventilation as I should do, as well as uh, extra corporeal life support, oxygenation like ECMO or Novalang. Here is an example of the rigid bronchoscopy. As you know, here is a port, the fibroscope and suction is inserted here. And we are connecting our breathing circuit to the mount uh, here, uh, it is called the Venturi port, and you can apply manual ventilation with some cricoid pressure to minimize the leak because they are using, uh, there sometimes there are leak around, the, usually there are leak around the rigid bronchoscopy. Rigid bronchoscopy is used for placement of blockers or for diagnosis, uh, sorry, for placement of stents or for lung, uh, for examination and detection, the exact location and extent of the tracheobronchial injury. After the surgical procedure or after pulmonology intervention with placement of a stent, you have to consider to use judges fluid therapy. Don't use leprar fluid therapy with drowning of lungs and need more post operative ventilation. And don't keep the lung dry to have acute kidney injury. Uh, gold directed therapy would be helpful. Using of steroids is very important. You have to consider using of some steroids like dexamethasone and, uh, and time enough before the time of end of surgery or intervention. Flexible bronchoscope as anesthetist, it is important to check the patency of airway and repair, adequacy of repair using fibroscope and the using the different, the estimating the difference between inspiratory and expiratory tidal volume to detect if there is the ill leakage and inadequate anastomosis. The important question now. Extubate the patient or not at the end of the procedures. It depends. It depends if you have a patient with multiple cold trauma, co associated trauma, particularly neurotrauma, and the patient has obtained or uh, unfavorable Galasco coma scale at the beginning, you cannot extubate. However, if the patient has conscious and there is no contraindication to extubate, you have to extubate the patient as early as you can. If you keep the patient ventilated, the true and false movement of the airway movement of mechanical ventilation working as a sharing force on the suture line of the anastomosis, leading to disruption of anastomosis. So you have to exhibit the extubating of these patients. If you are going to extubate the patients or not, the hip position should be kept in flexion position with unsuring the chin against the chest, usually with two stay in sutures between the chin and chest, or using a neck cooler with reverted to keep the front part of the neck cooler on the back and vice versa. This should be maintained for a minimum of one week until healing of the anastomosis line. Here is an example of unsuring sutures here between the chin and chest of this lady. And here, if you cannot use it, you have to keep the head in flexion position with using uh, many towels uh, below the head of the patient. Here is an example of CT with the patient in, uh, with the chin unsured to chest in flexion position. And before extubation, you have to consider avoiding of coughing and gagging, excessive coughing and gagging leading to disruption of anastomosis line. As you know, we have uh, some drugs at our hands to use them like lidocaine, either intravenously or nebulized lidocaine, narcotics, so dexamethamidine could be very helpful in such patients before extubation. And it is very important to look for the function of vocal cords after repair during extubating the patient with direct 
video laryngoscopic assessment of the movement of vocal cords. If you have complete bilateral vocal cord injury, the patient cannot sustain normal breathing and you have to go directly to do tracheostomy distal to the anastomosis side or proximal to anastomosis side if you has a, a distal injury. Post-operative ventilation should be minimized as much as possible, but if deemed necessary, in this case, you need to adjust the tip of your endotracheal tube beyond distal to the suture line, if possible, and to make sure the cuff of the endotracheal tube is not inflated against the suture line, because if it is inflated there, it will lead to jeopardize the because of blood flu and leading to necrosis and the highness of anastomosis. Multimodal analgesia, starting with local uh, infiltration or using of uh, some sort of regional plugs like intercostal plug or barovertebral plug for saracoscopic approach, for saracotomy approach, and uh, with the systemic opioid, opioid sparing, like using of ketamine, low dose of ketamine, magnesium sulfate, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, uh, with the barastamol, uh, using of dexamethamidine, all of these multimodal approaches are helpful for this patient. Prophylaxis against the post operative nausea and vomiting should be considered early enough before extubation. A combined uh, model, it could be helpful. After extubation, rehabilitation, pulmonary rehabilitation should be considered as much as tolerated as well as respiratory care to avoid lung collapse or to promote lung recruitment and inflation because you know, after injury, particularly for bronchial injury, the lung is collapsed and not ventilated. So our the loop. So you need to recruit this one through pulmonary physiotherapy with incentive spirometry, with diaphragmatic exercise, and the respiratory exercise. In conclusion, tracheobronchial injury are rare, but potentially life-threatening conditions. Close effective communication between the anesthesiologist and surgeon are essential to improve patients' outcomes. Thanks so much for your listening and I'm looking to receive your questions.